Good morning. Welcome to a fresh week of hashtag LD EduChat, leadership development in education online. All of last week's episodes and the ones leading up to that are all on our YouTube channel. So do hook into those if you haven't had a chance to so far on Twitter. Follow us at Chilton TSA and use the hashtag LD EduChat so that we can find your comments and your feedback and your thoughts as easily as possible. Today, we have Kat Scott, who will be looking at professional culture and looking at collaboration in CP CPD and how we can use that to build the cultures that we want within our schools. A, be a fascinating session. Later on this week, uh, we've got tomorrow, we've got David uh, Didale, who'll be looking at reading it aloud. Wednesday, we have Michael Payne, who'll be being the CEO. And then on Friday, we've got Asif Sadiq, MBE, who will be looking at how do we create diverse leadership teams. A fantastic week ahead. I uh, hope you can join us for all of those, hopefully. But today we've got, as I said, Cat Scut, and the first part of this will be a video and the second part will be a live Q&A. So without further ado, let's jump straight into the video. Hi there, my name's Kat uh, and I'm Director of Education and Research at the Chartered College of Teaching. This presentation that I'm going to give is all around building a strong professional culture in school, why that matters and what it looks like in practice. A fairly obvious place to start, I suppose, is why it's so important that that we help our teachers to be the best that they can be. We know that teaching quality is the biggest thing that we can control within our schools, the most important factor that can affect student achievement, student attainment. This is from a Sutton Trust report that I'm showing on the screen here. We know that this is also particularly true for pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds. The difference that teachers make and the quality of teaching that those children receive is hugely, hugely important. So clearly we need to be focused on thinking about the quality of teaching and that means focusing on thinking about teacher effectiveness, about teacher development and about making our schools and therefore our teachers the best that they can be. One of the most interesting pieces of research I've read in recent years is from 2014 and it's from two American researchers, Kraft and Pape, who were looking at this question of how teachers get better over time. And one of the things that you can see from this, this graph here, it's probably pretty unsurprising, um, is that teachers get better, they get more effective, um, the value added to their pupils increases with, with years of experience, certainly in the very early years of their career. You can see sort of naught to three years. There's a fairly steep curve there. Probably not a surprise to any of us that there's a steep learning curve at the beginning of your teaching career that actually from that moment you first step foot, set foot in a classroom and think, hmm, not quite sure what I'm doing here. Through those early years when you're starting to have your own class, you really feel like you're responsible for it, you're practicing things for the first time, and then you're trying them again and again, that you are really becoming more effective all the time. Um, it's worth just uh, highlighting that this particular study was looking at maths outcomes uh, and teacher effects on those. But then once you get past about kind of year three, it starts to flatten out a bit here on average, and we can see that there's a little bit of an increase over time, but not a huge increase in effectiveness beyond those those very early years of teachers careers but one of the interesting things is that this data and this graph uh, when it looks at the sort of average relationship between teacher experience and effectiveness it hides quite a lot of variation and that's not variation based on individual teachers it seems to be variation depending on the schools that those teachers are in so if we look at schools which are, are rated as having a strong professional environment and we'll talk a bit more about that later it seems that teachers in those schools continue to increase uh, in effectiveness at a higher rate than, than average. As you'd expect, schools with a weaker professional environment, you can see that here on the screen now, tend to plateau. You can really see there's not a great deal of increase at all in teacher effectiveness over time for teachers in those weaker professional environments. So this really highlights, I think, why a professional environment seems to matter and why a strong professional environment seems to matter. Kraft and Pape describe a strong professional environment in a number of ways. So they looked to identify what were the features of those schools where teachers seem to continue getting better. I don't think this list is going to be a massive surprise to anyone. The idea of consistently enforced rules around behaviour, time and resource for teachers to engage in professional development, there being a culture of trust and respect and of openness within the school, a clear commitment at the heart of everything to student achievement, 
opportunities for teachers to engage in collaboration with their peers. And finally, any teacher evaluation that takes place being focused on improving the quality of teaching, not on anything else. It's also worth saying, of course, that when I present this usually to a a room full of teachers, I think there's a lot of, well, hardly, that's hardly rocket science, is it? I don't think I know any teachers or school leaders who wouldn't want this for their school. And yet, of course, we do see scenarios where this isn't necessarily the case. Um, We do see schools, for example, where uh, the approaches to kind of monitoring and accountability uh, seem not quite what we would hope for in terms of a culture of trust. We see teacher evaluation not really seeming to be focused on improving the quality of teaching. Um, We see a limit to the amount of peer collaboration that there's opportunity for. And we can sometimes not see a great deal being invested in time, resources, professional development, equally also... Again, sometimes the rules around behaviour and the way in which those are applied are not always consistent. So although we might all see this as a goal, there are a whole number of reasons they might not be the case. I think, again, in the vast majority of cases, these are exactly what leaders want to have. But there can be a a huge range of other pressures that are influencing why these don't necessarily exist. These, of course, are in a normal time, in normal school environment. But I think they do have particular implications now as well. And I think the way in which people react in the kind of crisis situation that we're in at the moment is is perhaps sometimes almost a sort of even stronger version of what we see in normality. So these things around, for example, um, trust and autonomy that, that seem to be something that's really important here, we're seeing in many cases, but I have also seen examples of teachers being asked to account for everything that they're doing every minute of their day, um, things like quality of their online learning being judged within the first week in which they're trying to uh, provide for an online learning scenario. And again, I think this is driven in many cases by school leaders being worried about not doing the right things. But perhaps this is quite concerning if we want to ensure that our teachers are doing the best job that they can. It's certainly not something that we really want to see happening. I've tried to think about how all of these things relate, because of course, that's just a, a list of different features. But Using that research and then looking more widely at different research, I've tried to understand the relationship between these factors and what these might look like in practice. And the way that I've currently conceptualised it is that there are probably three foundational items that sit underneath everything else. And frankly, if they're not in place, no matter what you do around anything else, you're not going to see the sort of professional environment where your teachers improve and are able to produce the best outcomes for children and young people. Those three things are the behaviour policies, the trust and autonomy uh, for our teachers and that commitment to student achievement. Behaviour policies, I think, is a really important one. What Kraft and Pape weren't looking at here was the approach to behaviour management, but just this question of consistency. And that is something that comes up a lot, that, of course, if you have consistency in approach and there are very clear lines of expectation that all pupils and all teachers follow, that does make these things easier to handle. And I think, again, all of us would have from our experience in the classroom, the realisation that if you haven't got the right uh, approaches to behaviour, if you haven't got strong behaviour across the school, it's impossible to start worrying about the quality of your teaching and learning when you're spending half of your lessons trying to sort out issues with pupil behaviour. So that's absolutely key. In a way, again, I see this, as I've mentioned, as being the kind of foundations. Um, This is a bit of a a joke on Maslow's hierarchy. I think Wi-Fi even more important now than ever. All of these things that actually we need these really key foundations in our school before we can move on to anything else. And that's where behaviour is for me, that without that, nothing else that we do in the classroom is going to be as effective as it could or should be. The other point that I mentioned, or one of the other points that I mentioned, was this commitment to student achievement. Um, I think that's really important for a number of reasons. And I think it's worth highlighting, particularly in, again, the kind of current context, that this isn't just about uh, about pupil outcomes in exams or in uh, standardised tests. It's about students achieving everything they're able to. It's about the much wider student outcomes in terms of their well-being, their love of learning and everything else. But that that needs to be at the heart. The student outcomes need to be at the heart rather than perhaps being concerned about external measures, accountability and things like that. I think this is critically important in terms of teachers, because if we look at things like the uh, LKM Co report for Pearson, LKM Co are now the um, Centre for Education and Youth. They had a report a few years ago looking at why teachers came into the profession. It was called Why Teach? And making a difference, wanting to make a difference, was one of the main reasons that both primary and secondary teachers chose to join the profession, which, of course, 
if you then go into your school and you don't feel that you're having a chance to make a difference, you don't feel that you're achieving what you wanted to by becoming a teacher, that's likely to put you off wanting to stay. But there is also a balance point here. We know that teachers need to maintain a healthy detachment and to be able to maintain a sort of work-life balance. I know some people don't like that phrase, but if they're going to be able to do their job well, there's some interesting work by uh, Klusman and colleagues looking at this and kind of looking at sort of teacher types in, in terms of their engagement with the role, but also their ability to detach. And those who are hugely engaged in their role, but aren't able to detach, tended to burn out very quickly because it's not sustainable across a career. You have to be able to detach and recognise the things that you can't change and the things that you can't be responsible for. There's also something interesting in terms of workload here that actually... Um, we know that workload is a real problem in teaching. We know it's one of the main drivers for teachers leaving the profession, but it's a bit more complicated than just saying it's the amount of workload. Um, work from researchers like Sam Sims found that it wasn't just the number of hours or it wasn't the number of hours that teachers work that seemed to be influencing their job satisfaction. Some reported working higher hours uh, whilst also reporting higher levels of job satisfaction, some lower hours but still lower job satisfaction. It was to do with how manageable they felt that workload was and that was to do with the resources and support that they had. But wider conversation also seems to suggest that it's to do with the nature of the workload, that what seems to lead to sort of burnout and a lack of job satisfaction is a sense that what you're being asked to do is making no difference to student achievement, that it's being done uh, for the sake of paperwork, that it's bureaucratic, um, that it's because your senior leaders want to monitor what you're doing and it's not making a difference for pupil outcomes. So that what that workload is about is really, really key here. And that links quite interestingly to some more recent research by NFER and uh, working with the Teach Development Trust, where Jack Worth and his colleague looked at teacher autonomy. Um, they had some really interesting findings. It's quite a long report, but I would definitely recommend reading it. And we've also got a shorter article written by Jack Worth in our Chartered College Impact. And they found various things that, again, teacher autonomy seemed to be cor correlated with the manageability of workload. So where teachers felt they had higher autonomy, they felt their workload was more manageable. That seems to me to link back to this idea that if you're doing things that feel worthwhile, they feel more manageable. It also seemed to correlate with job satisfaction and teachers' intention to stay in the profession. One of the areas that was particularly important was this sense of autonomy over professional development goals. So uh, really the, the sense that they could choose what they wanted to be learning about. They had access to professional development rather than uh, that always being set centrally. It was also interesting that teachers seemed to have less autonomy than in similar professions. And um, there was something interesting about how teacher autonomy changed or didn't change across teachers' careers in that, as you might expect, early career teachers seem to have less autonomy and leaders seem to have more. But actually between those... Um, whilst you were a classroom teacher, there didn't seem to be much change with experience. So a highly experienced classroom teacher didn't seem to report being much more autonomous than a less experienced classroom teacher. Of course, um, this is all based on sort of self-report and so therefore perceived autonomy. And there's an interesting and important point, I think, that it's possible that also to do with the alignment of what you want and your values as a teacher with that of your school and your employer, because if you feel that you're able to do what you want to, you might feel that you have a higher level of autonomy than actually in reality you do. And if there's a conflict between how you think something should be handled and how it's actually handled in your school, that's likely to sort of lead rise to your realisation that you have limited autonomy over that. So there are some complexities behind this as well. But the idea of teacher autonomy, the idea of trust is so critical. And I think especially in, in these times, um, it's a real shift for all of us, many teachers not being in the classroom every day, a whole new approach to teaching and learning. And Again, that can lead to some undesirable behaviours in terms of wanting to feel like we're in control of what teachers are doing at all times. But this trusting and autonomy of teachers is so, so key now, I think. Teachers have enough pressures without needing to uh, feel that they're having to justify their existence at every moment of the day. So once we've got those three sort of foundational aspects in place, there are things that we can start to do that build on those. And I think those are really teacher evaluation, which I've put as the sort of next layer up, because if you haven't got a trustful system, if you haven't got a sense that your teachers feel autonomous, then any sort of teacher evaluation is likely to feel high pressure, high risk, and not have the sort of impact um, that we've talked about, which is that we want it to be about improving the quality of teaching. That trust has to be there before that. We also want to be making sure that we've got high quality professional learning opportunities and opportunities for teachers to collaborate. But again, just to highlight, putting these things in on their own without first working on the culture around behaviour, around trust, and around that sort of central focus on student achievement 
these are doomed to fail if we haven't got that in place first. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about professional development because um, I think it's probably one of the areas that's most widely covered and professional development standards, I'm sure, from the, the DFE will be very familiar to all of you. But of course, these are things to be thinking about. One thing I did want to pick up on, which I think, again, is particularly interesting in the current climate, is um, this idea of professional development needing to meet needs. This builds a bit on the idea from the NFER report on teacher autonomy that actually this sense of choice over your professional development goals, this sense of it being related to you as an individual, not just generic, everyone in our school needs to learn this because it's in the school development plan, uh, I think is so important. There's a, a few bits of research that highlight the importance of it being matched to teacher needs if we're looking at influencing student outcomes. Philip Accordingly and colleagues report highlighted that, of course, it does also need to meet the needs of schools. And that interaction between the needs of individual teachers and the needs of the school is really key. There's a, an important conversation to be had there. One thing that I read um, from Dylan William a couple of years ago that I thought was quite an interesting idea was that actually also rather than it being matched to teacher needs in the sense of identifying okay here's a weakness that I have as a teacher or here's a weakness that I've identified for you as a teacher it being about actually maybe there's there's something more powerful about teachers becoming more expert in their areas of strength rather than focusing on areas of weakness and always trying to kind of fill gaps can we help them to get even better at something that they're already good at and Antonio and Kiriakides have suggested that in order to therefore have um, effective CPD, we need to understand where teachers are at and tailor the CPD to what they need to develop to the next level. Developmental teacher evaluation, again, not going to spend a lot of time on this, but luckily I think we're seeing very little in terms of schools now choosing to grade individual lessons, but it's still not unheard of. Rob Coe's work around this is particularly interesting and important, highlighting how inaccurate any attempt to uh, to grade an individual lesson on a sort of four point scale is likely to be and that really you might as well toss a coin. But the high, what we're talking about here is this idea of, you know, teacher observation, teacher evaluation, all being about improving teaching quality, about supporting people to move forwards. There's lots of ways in which we will carry out teacher evaluation other than just observation, but just given um, uh, the amount of time available. I'm thinking mostly about observation here. It's also important to, to note that kind of getting the relationship right between lesson observations and performance management can be quite hard. There's been a few attempts to sort of try different ways of separating out a sense of observation, which should be formative and supportive and helping teachers to move forwards from uh, a sense of performance management. And that's included things like obviously making sure that it's not your line manager carrying out the observation, um, even trying people externally carrying out observations. Uh, but what research suggests there is that no matter what the model is, it's very hard for, first of all, for the teacher being observed not to feel that it's going to be linked in some way to performance management, but also genuinely for it not to be related to that in some way for, for there to be a sense of kind of sharing of observations and things like that within school. So it's pretty difficult to get that right. Uh, one approach that I thought that was quite interesting around teacher observation um, that David Didow wrote about in a blog a couple of years ago was, um, I think he was thinking particularly about sort of Ofsted lesson observations, but how they might work as being almost a sort of starting point for a conversation where rather than just a lesson being watched and then some sort of general discussion afterwards, there would be a conversation afterwards where the teacher would talk about why they took the approaches they did, why they uh, why they did what they did at particular points. And that kind of professional conversation where teachers are being encouraged to articulate and demonstrate their expertise and they're being, again, trusted to know what's right for their classes could potentially be really powerful. I really like that idea and I'd, I'd recommend having a look at that blog. One of the most interesting things, again, that I think we see in this work around strong professional culture is this word collaboration, which um, which gets bandied around quite a lot, it's fair to say. And it can mean quite a lot of different things, I think, from, from people feeling, oh, yes, we do collaboration well, that they've got people working together or that they actually just they're making time for teachers to spend time together. It could be lots of different things. Um, there's a few pointers that we can gather from research about how collaboration might work particularly interestingly. So I was interested, first of all, in work from James Spillane and colleagues in the US, which they were looking at how teachers or who teachers ask for advice in schools in the US. And I think what, what we'd mostly expect would be that teachers probably have an idea of who their most effective colleagues are. And so if they want advice and information, they might go to them. But interestingly, in this piece of research, what, what Spillane and his colleagues found was that actually the highly effective teachers were the ones that were doing most of the seeking of advice and information. They were the ones that were going and talking to others more frequently. And I think there's something, a really important point there, really, about being willing to learn from others, being willing to discuss things, always seeking to develop seems to be really related there to 
um, to our effectiveness as practitioners. Also, again, research from the US found that working alongside highly effective colleagues accelerated the rate um, at which teachers own effectiveness grew. And that was particularly true for teachers early in their career. So being in a, a really highly effective department starts to help you become more effective, probably not surprising, but important, I think. Again, James Spilling, another piece of work, found that working through peers and, and through uh, sort of champions could be a really effective ways of a way of changing teachers' beliefs and instructional practices. They looked at approaches to mathematics instruction and how that could kind of be cascaded through champions. So that might be quite helpful if we're thinking in our school about how we introduce new approaches, how we change culture, how we change practices. Of course, there are very specific um, approaches to to collaboration rather than these vaguer ones that we've been talking about, like instructional coaching, which has consistent evidence of impact on pupil outcomes, which relatively few pieces of professional development do. So that's one very specific approach that we might want to be looking at. But one kind of word of warning from Rob Coe and colleagues was that one of the challenges in a move towards a more kind of collaborative in-school um, professional development approach, which is really powerful in many ways, rather than seeking to send people on one day courses all the time, is that making sure there's sufficient challenge involved is really important too. Um, because otherwise you've got this risk that actually you're just continuing to embed existing practices. There's nothing saying, well, what if the way that we're doing it isn't the best way to do it? So I think that's important too. Once you've got those sort of three things in place, then I think we start to move into a bit of a cycle of, of kind of a sort of positive cycle, I think, for our individual teachers. We, we start to see teachers who are, have got high levels of job satisfaction. And that's obviously also related to retention. Those two things, in fact, are very closely related, partly because the questions that are often used in surveys to identify job satisfaction include things like, are you thinking about leaving your job? Um, which obviously are very similar questions to those that are used to understand retention. But there's a few things to just pick out here. So from NFER research from a couple of years ago, we can see that this, this actually was part of a, a big debate around whether um, teacher pay matters, that often it's found that when teachers leave the teaching profession, they, they take a pay cut. So that has, in some cases, sort of been used as an argument that, that it's not pay, that pay doesn't matter. But actually, I think that it's the relationship between pay, workload and job satisfaction. It's again, it's much more complicated than that. And what you can see in this graph is just um, how satisfied teachers felt while teaching and then after leaving teaching in their job. So you can see that that naught line in the middle there is when they leave teaching and, and you can see a pretty dramatic change there in how satisfied they report being in their jobs after teaching. So this job satisfaction question is really, really important in terms of retention in the teaching profession. Sam Sims did some analysis of TALIS data a few years ago, and this was looking at what seemed to be related to teacher job satisfaction. Again, unsurprising, um, but also comforting that these things relate very closely, I think, to what Kraft and Pape found in a, a strong school environment, the ideas of cooperation or collaboration, professional development, discipline, feedback, workload, uh, but also strong leadership and opportunity, opportunities for progression seem to be important there in, in supporting teacher job satisfaction. Now, we already know that these things relate through to effectiveness, and I want to talk briefly also about the relationship between effectiveness and self-efficacy. As we've looked at the very beginning of this, we know that in the right environments, teachers, uh, as they get more experience, do become more effective. So if we can retain teachers and they're in strong environments, we're going to see them becoming more effective. That's going to lead to better pupil outcomes. But there's also this interesting relationship between effectiveness and self-efficacy that I think brings things back round in a bit of a loop. So self-efficacy is this sense of how effective we are, our sense of how good a job we're able to do. Remember that when we what we talked earlier about uh, reasons that teachers join the profession, and one of those was thinking you can make a difference. Another one was a sense that you'd be good at it. So I think teachers feeling that they're doing a good job is really key here. Some research from quite a while ago now, from 2001, did find that more effective teachers tend to have greater self-efficacy. Looking at that research and other research, it's quite interesting to try and determine whether that's because teachers know how good or otherwise they are at their job. Is it a sort of simple, if you're good at your job, you know, so you have greater self-efficacy. That's probably the case, but also there is a bit of a sense of having confidence, having greater self-efficacy seems to feed back into your effectiveness. And we know that self-efficacy, a sense of being good at your job, is linked into job satisfaction and again in, in retention rates. So we see these things coming round in a cycle. What's quite important, I think, is that it's not just about individuals here. We've talked about collaboration already, but this sense of being satisfied, this sense of wanting to say in a school, and particularly this sense of how effective you are and your sense of self-efficacy are not just about you as an individual. They're about how your environment feels, about how your department or your year group feel, about how 
your school feel. Uh, Daniel Murs now at Ofsted and, uh, and his colleague Reynolds wrote about this in their book, this idea that a sense of self-efficacy is not just individual, it's collective. And of course, if we're then focusing on approaches to CPD that might be collaborative, we know that's one of the PD standards, we're helping to develop the expertise of the individual, the confidence of the individual, but also the collective. And that's why I think a lot of these kind of collaborative approaches that we're seeing increasing interest in are really important. Dylan William, for example, suggests that we need to have regular sustained time, at least an hour a month for teachers to meet and work together on their practice if we want to see real improvement. There's lots of different models that are similar to that from uh, sort of teacher professional development groups, journal clubs, uh, different sorts of reading clubs. All of this is quite interesting, I think, in the current time, because, of course, you might feel like quite an effective teacher on the ground day to day doing a job that you're very comfortable with. But teachers are all being suddenly pulled out of that environment into often a sort of approach they're not that comfortable or experienced with. And that can be really, really uncomfortable for our teachers. So we need to be looking at how we support that individuals, but also taking this point of, of kind of the collective environment, thinking about how are we reassuring our schools that we're doing a good job, that we're doing the best that we can in challenging situations. And how are we ensuring that we're still having these sustained times, these opportunities for collaboration and discussion. Journal clubs and book clubs, reading groups can work really well online. Um, there's actually uh, a couple of articles and guidance documents on those on the Charter College website in our COVID-19 resources, which are worth having a look at because it is a really important that we, we make sure teachers continue to be connected. Teaching is a strange job at the best of times when you spend most of your day with 30 children staring at you, but not necessarily that much time with adults and moving away from having uh, even the sort of break and lunch and after school times together as as we're seeing a lot of the time at the moment, making sure those, those opportunities to connect, to collaborate, to, to just feel part of a, a collective whole that's doing a good job is really important, I think. Of course, that goes again one layer further, that it's not just about schools or departments' collective effectiveness and self-efficacy. It's all of these things exist in a wider education system, that if we have an education system that has punitive accountability measures that put pressure on schools to do things that don't seem particularly helpful in terms of workload, of course, that's going to lead to practices in schools that we don't want to see into reduction in job satisfaction but conversely if we have the right policies around professional learning around workload and everything else in the wider system we have the right setups for that then we start to see these things being much easier to do in schools so we can't look at any of these at just a single level and really I think that's hopefully where or where we'd like the Charter College to be coming in, along with a whole range of other organisations in the system to ensure that we are building a wider education system that allows for all of these things to take place. If you want to read more about any of the research that I've talked about here around school culture, there's a, a web link there which will take you just to a reading list that I've produced. I think most of the articles that I mentioned there should be in there and lots more besides. There's uh, research, there's blogs, there's examples of practice from schools. And also of particular interest might be a free CPD report that we published on teacher CPD. That's got lots of international examples, articles from internationally renowned, renowned academics and practitioners in the field. That's free to download on our website. And I hope that you'll find that interesting. Just to give a little bit more background about us, the Chartered College of Teaching is the professional body for teachers in the UK, but also working with teachers worldwide in international schools and beyond. We're all about celebrating and supporting and connecting our teachers to make sure that they're able to develop and have job satisfaction, all of the things that I've been talking about, to ultimately benefit pupils and society. And a big part of that is about thinking about the st status of teaching profession. And one of the things that I think has been positive over the last few weeks, if anything positive can be taken from this, is the recognition that of, of the role that teachers play and of how critical and how important they are. Have a look, uh, ITV have been showing messages of thank yous to teachers, which I think really start to show the celebration that is happening there. And I think happens much of the time anyway, but sometimes very quickly quietly. There's a few things on the screen here just highlighting some of the things that we're aiming to do. And as a member, you get access to a whole range of different things. But again, because lots of these are sort of freely available, whether you're a member or not, and a lot of them link to what we're talking about here, we have print and online copies of our journal. You can see that at impact.chartered.college, which has a huge range of articles from teachers, academics, uh, school leaders, and sometimes also articles that partner with other professions, where we're looking at links between our profession and other professions, including the medical profession. We also have a whole range of shorter articles, things like compact guides that are just one page introductions to key principles and practices through to um, extensive case studies and video case studies from schools showing what some of these things look like. We run events during usual times. Those are face-to-face -face, uh, regional events. During the current situation, we're doing a lot more 
online. We publish things to support people in running, again, face-to-face sometimes, but currently more online reading groups. We have CPD packs. We have all sorts of opportunities to contribute to and be engaged with uh, policy at a national level and really seeking to connect teachers across the country. If you want to know more, you can find out more on our website or do get in touch with me. Thank you very much and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Um, just wanted to firstly thank Kat for her excellent presentation and some of the sort of key points that she's raised there. Firstly, I want to also sort of give a quick shout out to some of our guests that are joining us today. So we've got Francis from New York, so all the way over in America. We've got people right across the country, Stephen up in Yorkshire, Claire Weeks down in Southport and Ni Wen in Indonesia. So quite a few people from sort of across the globe as well. So Kat, I think there's a, a really good question from Chris Redding, which I think you wanted to pick up on. And it ties in with a lot of questions that have come up as well. So I'll pass it over to yourself, Kat. Great. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, everyone, who's here this morning on a bank holiday. I think I have my doubts that anyone was going to want to turn up at 9 a.m. on a bank holiday to join the session. So it's uh, it's really great to see so many of you and some great questions here. A lot of the questions that have come through have kind of linked together. And I thought I would start with Chris's question about, uh, do I have a view on performance management and its effectiveness, um, i.e. on pupil performance and results? Um, my response to this is going to be uh, a combination of uh, some reference to some research, but also, I guess, my, my sort of professional experience and, and views on this. I hope that's OK. Um, the Education Endowment Foundation have looked specifically at performance related pay um, and the impact of that on pupil performance and results. Um, if you have a look at uh, their research around that, um, it would largely suggest that it's not a great idea that we really sh that, that it doesn't seem to be adding any value to pupil learning um obviously performance related pay is a different thing to performance management but i'll, I'll start with that because because that's an area that eef have covered i think it's um i remember when it was sort of introduced a few years ago the, the first time and i think it's a really difficult thing to get right because um thinking of the organization i worked in at that time um, who did introduce it, um, it was a, a school group, and um, they had quite set proportions, for example, where they said uh, X percent of people will get outstanding and will get the, the biggest leap in pay, and X proportion will get good and get this, um, and then, then others would get satisfactory, um, I can't remember, they didn't call them those things, but there were essentially four levels, and the problem is that the vast, vast majority, if not all of, of our staff, were wanting to do the best job they were able to do. And it sort of sets up a deficit model where everyone wants to, or, or thinks perhaps that they, are, they deserve to be outstanding, but anything less than that is seen as, you know, even if supposedly outstanding is, is very, what very few people will get, it feels that if you haven't got that, there's something you haven't done, something that you haven't done wrong. And I know that colleagues found that quite difficult and, and the approach did then change to not having these kind of percentage quotas, but um, but I can see how performance related pay can be quite damaging. Um, and that's often what we think about when we think about performance management or what jumps to our mind is things like, um, I guess, thinking about uh, action plans and things like that. It becomes, again, this deficit model. What am I doing wrong? What have I not done well? Um, and there are also all sorts of challenges in, in how you make decisions about uh, what teachers are doing well, again, particularly on the kind of performance related pay front um, or, or any aspect of performance management, really using simple pupil outcomes, which is always tempting because that's what schools are typically being uh, being sort of judged on in league tables. And it's easy to think, well, we'll feed that down to our teacher level performance management as well hugely problematic all sorts of reasons that across the short term at least those are a really uh, ineffective way of trying to judge teacher effectiveness um what i have seen so someone else asked this question about um whether i'd seen any good examples uh you know i haven't seen the long-term effects of this so um this is just my instinct that this feels like quite an interesting approach um chris moise who's based in the southwest um has started to introduce an approach that's really focused on asking teachers to demonstrate how they're developing themselves. So it all being about professional growth rather than pupil outcomes or value added. So um, I think, you know, of course, we know that one of the things that's helpful for teachers is receiving advice and feedback on development. So the idea of sort of throwing out performance management and saying, let's not do it is maybe not, um, not an option, but can we focus performance management processes on really developing teachers on asking them to 
think about their their ways in which they're developing or looking at their approaches to their own professional learning rather than it focusing on this kind of um, slightly reductive people outcome model I think would be my advice there. So it sounds like you've picked up quite a few questions there <laughs> within one so I think um, it's obviously just a case of addressing for a lot of people um, that question about performance management like you've already mentioned being related to pay progression and so forth and kind of addressing that in a more sort of developmental conversation rather than it just being a you know are you doing your job as such and so is there anything sort of advice that you would give to leaders as to how to make that a more constructive process rather than a more sort of uh, reviewing performance as such I think this, it's this um, I mean again it sounds simple but this idea of it being focused on um, on improving teaching so uh, understanding what teachers um, can do thinking about the CPD that they're undertaking thinking about the CPD that they want to undertake I think um, critically it has to be kind of um, I think it's that, it's that Dylan William quote about um, all teachers being able to get better not because they're not good enough but because uh, because everyone can improve that's not the exact phrasing he uses which is much neater but I can't remember it right now um, it, it's moving away from this idea that that um, CPD or coaching or mentoring is because you're not doing a good enough job this risk this this certainly used to be the case with being allocated a coach or a mentor if you weren't in your early career it was a it was because there was a problem where actually if we start to move to seeing coaching and mentoring as the research suggests as a really powerful way to help teachers to keep improving but also to help teachers to uh, to be satisfied in their roles to um, to reduce burnout and things like that it becomes a positive thing to have that opportunity and again maybe making those sorts of opportunities open to all rather than feeling that you're the one teacher that's being asked to do these uh, do these things um so i think you know that sort of focus is great and, and as i mentioned the um chris moise his name is spelt uh, chris and then m-o-y-s-e if you google him he has a blog uh, and he's shared lots of the resources that he's developed for the school trust he was working with, which look about look at all these things. So uh, changing approaches to lesson observations, changing approaches to CPD, introducing coaching approaches, a changing approaches to performance management. Um, so uh, I think that's a really interesting place to start. And he's had really positive feedback on the approaches that they're introducing there. So I'd definitely recommend that for the sort of practical resources. Yeah, I think that kind of picks off a few other sort of questions that people would have around performance management. Um, I think if we jump to Paul Simmons' question, so he's looking at schools that require improvement with historically low SATs outcomes, and what should SLT focus on when considering collaboration and autonomy? Or should development be more prescriptive? I mean, this is a very, very difficult question to answer. Um, I think it's going to be such a tricky balance because you can understand um, the appeal of a huge amount of kind of prescription and consistency. Um, I talked earlier about kind of consistency around uh, behaviour and why that's so important. But also, you know, this idea of kind of consistent approaches can make things um, more straightforward for pupils and for teachers. I think one of the risks can be is that uh, is that a kind of overly prescriptive approach might help um, in the short term, but perhaps then it's how you move back into giving teachers more trust and autonomy in the long term. So rather than it, uh, than, than when a school is is needing to make rapid improvement, um, thinking, okay, we've got to have everyone doing exactly the same things. Um, there might be things that are priorities for the school that are obviously going to be priorities for professional learning, but, uh, but you've got your short term versus your long term goals there, I think. Um, all of the things that I've talked about here, uh, I think do apply uh, sort of regardless of, of where your school is at in its journey, the importance of teachers feeling uh, confident. One of the issues in a school um, which is a sort of requires improvement, for example, is that um, I guess is that it really affects teachers self efficacy. So I talked about the importance of, of individual self efficacy for teachers confidence that they can make a difference. Um, and then that being part of a sort of wider collective self efficacy. If you're in a school that, that's been judged um, to not be doing a good enough job, that can be really difficult to work through. And so a big focus there might be within that school on those areas of, of recognising that teachers are able to do a good job they are able to make a difference for the pupils they're working with so sort of tackling that um that confidence issue that can happen as well i think will be important there i think yeah really sort of some good points there i think um one of the things that i have sort of some some question over as well is from uh, i think it's hedaya hammock so there's some teachers who may not be interested in cpd at all some some teachers are more experienced than others any suggestions on how you can approach sort of en engaging with those that are perhaps less motivated by cpd and um, given 
sort of the evidence that there's still returns whilst they may be diminishing in the later stages of their career. How would you challenge that? I think it's a great question. Um, and it's definitely sometimes teachers who are not interested in CPD, but also just sometimes you see in schools that it will be, uh, there'll be a capped CPD budget and there'll be some people who are really good at always coming and saying, can I go on X CPD course? Because they're being proactive, they're finding things that they're interested in. Um, and you know, just by virtue of them being the ones that ask, they're the ones that attend that CPD. There are other teachers who are attending things in their own time, which, um, you know, has its own challenges in terms of what we expect from the profession. Um, I think this actually links back to, to some of the things we've talked about around performance management, actually making it um, an expectation for all teachers to be engaging in professional learning. I think it's important to, um, to think about the, the many different ways in which CPD can manifest itself though, because what we need to avoid is a kind of oversimplistic um, CPD involves going on a day course, for example. Uh, there may be teachers who aren't necessarily um, wanting to go on a course, but might be engaging in all sorts of reading. They might be reading journals, they might be reading education books. Someone uh, mentioned further up something about, um, about Twitter and the role of kind of uh, social media and attendance of things outside of the school date to the part that those can play in a kind of professional culture. And they're not always recognised in school because teachers don't uh, so school leaders don't necessarily know everything that their teachers are doing outside of school hours um, and rightly so um, so I think there's there's something there about making sure that CPD is valued making sure that it's a part of any sort of performance management performance development conversations um, I think there are ways that it can also be supported financially at a relatively low cost I've seen schools doing things like offering a kind of nominal 50 pound voucher that all of their teachers have access to that they can spend on books they can spend on going to a research ed event on a saturday they can spend on charter college membership um that that just gives them a sense of kind of that their their professional learning in these more informal ways is being prioritized and they're being supported to engage in this um, so there are different things that can be done around that i do also agree though that it can be a challenge that um, moving away from that culture that I've already mentioned where teachers feel like they're being told they need CPD because of a, a sort of perceived weakness or that they're not good enough is a bit difficult. Um, one of the things we do in our chartered teacher programme, um, which is our uh, sort of expert teacher accreditation programme, is we really encourage teachers to reflect in quite a lot of detail on what their professional learning goals are for the year, what are the things they want to learn and be able to do, and then setting different ways that they might engage in professional learning towards those. So again, linking it back to this kind of goal setting, not just abstract, I'd like to go on a course, um, but really thinking in quite a targeted way. Again, um, coaching is really powerful. Coaching and mentoring can be really powerful if you are being coached and mentored, but also research from Cure suggests that it's uh, a huge learning experience for those acting as a coach, those acting as a mentor. So for your experienced teachers, perhaps think about what are the opportunities for them to support, support the professional learning of others, which uh, kind of inevitably leads to their own professional learning. So I think there's some really good things. <clears throat> and I think you kind of, um, you sort of hit the nail on the head as well. And I like the idea of the 50 pounds budget as such as a sort of discretionary amount for the needs to be met of the individuals kind of bringing us back to points within your sort of presentation as well. So brilliant, yeah. Moving on then, so if we're having a look then, observation seems to be kind of a theme that's coming up as a stressful sort of task that people have to go through from a performance management perspective. And it's how can we make that less stressful and more productive in terms of identifying supporting staff without it being seen as critiquing their weaknesses? I mean, that's a very, it feels a very poignant question when I've uh, just um, had to sit and watch myself giving a presentation, which obviously <laughs> is not something I do very often. And uh, it's very easy to think of all of the things that I know I've done wrong there, including uh, speaking far too quickly, for which apologies. Um, it's something that I've been working on, but clearly not successfully. Um, but I think there's this yeah, this question of uh, actually using an observation as a chance for a, a conversation. I, I mentioned this briefly, and I, I think uh, you've got David Didal speaking tomorrow, haven't you? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I just, it was a, a very sort of simple blog that he wrote a couple of years ago that had this idea of how do we use it as a starting point for a conversation. So the sorts of prompts that you might have were, were sort of more things like, oh, why did you take this approach at this time? Um, and making sure that's not in a judgmental way. It's wanting to give the teacher a chance to really reflect on and discuss what they did. I think 
there's some interesting things that have been done and that, again we've tried in some of our, our programs around using video for these things as well which in the first place can be an utterly utterly terrifying thing um because the idea of being filmed while you're teaching just is i think inherently quite uncomfortable for a lot of people but if you're able to move away from the kind of focusing on um on things that don't matter it's a really good way to see uh, and be able to reflect on your own practice and that can be quite a useful prompt or quite a useful stimulus for um for you in a discussion around a lesson observation so it's not kind of you trying to remember what you did or were saying which is quite hard when you're in uh, sort of live in a lesson um and then feeling like another teacher is judging you if you're able to um, have some particular points to sort of focus on and discuss and that means you don't even necessarily have to have an observer in the lesson with you we've done some things around getting um, uh, early career teachers to they might film the whole lesson but then actually they edit out maybe a, a five minute slot that they want to discuss with a, a coach or a mentor where they're able to then have a discussion about here's what I did here here's why I did this, here's what I think worked, what could I have done differently, that actually they're really directing that conversation. And I think that's what's key is rather than it being someone coming in with their, um, their goals of what they want to see you doing and a tick list of yes, well, you haven't done X. Um, that's what becomes, um, I guess, takes, takes away your kind of sense of autonomy. If as a teacher, you can say, here's a thing that I'm focusing on, speaking less quickly, or, um, or for example, um, you know, my questioning uh, using wait time or um, using cold calling, something really quite specific you want to focus on, asking someone to come and watch you just for a bit of a lesson, or again, taking a video of yourself and sharing that, um, that's a way of you driving the conversation more. Uh, and I think that can feel more empowering than some approaches to um, to sort of observation that we see. I think I've seen and heard of schools kind of even going and taking it a step further and having almost a plaque on their door saying, here's the things that I'm developing in or trying to develop in, come and watch and observe and almost an invitational to for someone to come in and comment on um, an area that they're trying to develop on. But that's that requires that level of self-recognition, I suppose, rather than necessarily someone sort of telling them <laughs> put this on there as such okay so um this we've had a couple of sort of questions sort of uh, dotting around looking at the graph that you kind of bookended your presentation with about the development sort of increases sharply over the first sort of few years of uh, teaching and then sort of almost uh, plateaus to a point uh, not quite plateauing but the differences between obviously school environments that have a, a very professional environment versus those that don't for a member of staff who might be in a less professional school, what could they do to ensure that they don't get left behind? Now, that is that is the really difficult question, isn't it? Is that because with, with so much of what I've talked about, it is about the collectiveness of your school. It's about yeah. the opportunities for collaboration. Um, it's about the opportunities for development. I think that um, someone referenced this in, in their question, actually. What, one of the things that's quite exciting um, about what we've seen over the last few years is the plethora of opportunities that have grown up outside of schools for professional learning. So, I mean, things like this morning, um, uh, things like um, Saturday conferences and research ed. I absolutely do see that there are some issues with that as well, and that many would probably quite rightly argue that um, we shouldn't get to a point where the culture in teaching is that you're expected to do professional learning in your own time, given we know the um, workload issues the profession already has. So there's definitely a question and something long, like this, this shouldn't be the long-term solution, I don't think, but there is something powerful about teachers, um, I don't really want to use this phrase, but I'm going to, to teach sort of taking back control to an extent, teachers having opportunities for professional learning to see things outside of how things are done in their school. Um, I think there are some interesting things going on as well, like the early career framework, um, which is obviously being introduced in, in four, well, three regions from September and then nationally from the following September. Um, it's got a very sort of specific, quite detailed framework for what teachers need to be taught about. And what's really critical um, in that is that it isn't a tick list of things that teachers have to be able to demonstrate they can do. It's a tick list of anything of things that they they must be supported to learn about it is raising the bar for the quality of professional learning and support that those teachers are getting in the early years of their career and i suppose what my hope is that that really raises the bar for teachers expectations if you've come into a, a teaching career had a great training experience as teachers are getting now and then a really supportive um 
highly professional learning led first two years in your career, your expectations of the support and the development that you'll continue to get might be raised. And that begins to shift the culture uh, in all schools. And again, these are things that we know are happening in, in many schools already. But where that's not the case, I hope that this will help to raise the bar. Getting things right early on, giving people that encouragement to continue to grow throughout their entire career and progression. If we can just answer the one last question sort of written. So from Hidayah, uh, I agree to further developing teacher strength through further CPD and becoming an expert in that field. How would schools find a balance between developing strengths and areas that need development simultaneously? So it's that mm. developing the strengths, but equally managing the weaknesses, perhaps or areas of development. Uh, yeah, and I think alongside that, the tension between um, individuals' priorities and schools' priorities, because you end up with a kind of sort of matrix of things you're thinking about there that you may have things that as a school you know you need to you need to work on, but those aren't necessarily the focus or interest for a particular individual. Um, in terms of how you find a balance, I think just to say that it that it is a balance. Um, and that sometimes through developing someone's strengths, that also helps with developing the areas that, that they need to work on as well. So it's not kind of a choice of just one or, or just the other. But I can definitely see, and someone asked the reference, it was David uh, Dylan Williams's um, 2018 book that he mentions this in. Um, he doesn't reference any particular research that this idea is based on, but it just was something that really struck me that I can absolutely see that, that rather than going to a teacher and saying, okay, well, we know, for example, you're not very good with using technology. So we're going to send you on a course that's about podcasting or whatever. Um, and that seems pretty doomed to failure on the whole. Like it's, it's going to, uh, they'll, they'll go and they'll, do it but will it really change their practice whereas actually if you think what are the things that you're great at how can you develop those that might be a much more uh, much more productive way to work and, and that maybe also helps with those those kind of uh more experienced teachers who um don't want to feel like they're being told oh you you know um you need to do this because you're struggling with this area when actually they're doing a really great job with their class but if it's uh, more pitched as how can you develop your expertise still further in those areas that you're um you're really good at that could be quite powerful i think i think i think that's kind of key thing is to acknowledge and recognize that we do have experts in our schools and yes you know not to use that phrase as we mentioned earlier that everyone can still develop and so forth but yeah promoting their expertise giving the positives there but also using that as a platform to kind of help with their development as well seems to be kind of a, a good thought. Kat, is there any other questions that you wanted to pick out? Oh, so Tina's point, um, I don't have an answer to this, so it's probably a terrible question to pick really, but um, Tina mentions sort of considering beyond the school, school clusters, um, is there a place for developing teams of experts across a community of schools? I think so. And um, I think it's one of the things that's most interesting and potentially powerful about things like the multi-academy trust model. And of course, um, that's not the only way of developing these um, these groups but actually um, if you have kind of professional learning communities that are working across schools um, it gives you something outside of your own setting um, one of the slightly strange things about teaching is that you are sort of have eyes on you all day it's incredibly um, sort of tiring from that perspective you, you're almost sort of performing all day and yet you don't spend very much of that at all with other adults um, you can be quite isolated in your classroom you've got uh, 30 children around you but you don't just because of the pressure of the timetable you don't often get to spend that much time seeing what other teachers are doing um a kind of great culture around things like lesson study or, or really more formative lesson observations can help with that in school but there's also something really powerful about going and seeing how things are done in an environment that's quite different from your own so uh creating connections across school becomes easier maybe in something like a multi-academy trust but of course local authorities have been doing this for years as well schools who are just connecting in their own partnerships there are organizations like challenge partners who work on these kind of collaborative models and i think they're quite important if we if we reflect back on on the idea of kind of collaborative professional learning and we remember that the challenge with that can be having enough external challenge so you're not just doing collaboratively looking at things and going oh yeah great we're doing this well or yeah this works all right doesn't it but actually having someone to come in and go oh why are you doing it like that can really be powerful for for reflecting so um yeah hugely powerful opportunities for developing um people across communities of schools okay well well uh 
wrap up there then. So um, thank you, Kat. It's been excellent, obviously, some really sort of key ideas. Thank you, obviously, for your time. Thank you, obviously, for your useful insights into sort of the wide and wonderful world of CPD. And uh, No problem at all. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. I covered a few different things there. And um, yeah, it's been it's been great to see so many people up early on a Monday morning learning and thinking about how they can support and develop their staff. So uh, I think that's a, a great sign for the staff that you're all working with. Brilliant. Thank you. So just to wrap a few bits and pieces then. So obviously, over the course this week, we're still here today. Um, we're here tomorrow, Wednesday and Friday. So tomorrow we've got David Didal talking about reading out loud. Michael Payne being the CEO on Wednesday and Asif Sadiq about creating diverse leadership teams for, for this week. On Twitter, Children TSA, you can find us using the hashtag LD Edgechat um, and you'll be able to follow us and obviously ask any questions. Please feel free to subscribe and you'll keep up to date with all of the upcoming videos. I think in total we're going to have over 50 different sessions over the course of the following month or so. Thank you for your time and hopefully we'll catch up again tomorrow.